Burn on, big river, burn on. The Clean Water Act turns 40 years old next month. Many attribute the 1969 burning of the Cuyahoga River as being the seminal moment that kicked off the environmental movement. But as with any turning point in history, it took a new generation of leadership to make that happen. For years, Cleveland has been known by that infamous lyric. But as you're about to see, perhaps now we'll be known for something more. The difference about Lake Erie was that we had parks on the lake in the city limits of Cleveland. And there were places that you could stop and rent boats, which was quite commonly done, and row out into the lake and fish at night, usually for blue pike, because blue pike was the fish for that lake. The blue pike tasted great, a favorite for anglers and commercial fishermen. So the butcher shops around town would have signs in the window every Friday saying, fresh blue pike today, you know. We used to use coal shovels to shovel them in the boxes to get price, you know what I mean? Big wide shovels. Blue pike have gone the way of passenger pigeons and dodo birds, extinct. Here's the last blue pike, frozen in time at the University of Toledo. Jim Anthony caught it in 1962. He thought about eating it for old time's sake, but he stashed it in his freezer. Now, it's his gift to science. I personally always believed that it was the pollution that killed them off. Some say the blue pike was overfished, but pollution from the Cuyahoga River didn't help. All the chemicals they used to make steel, they would just put them in there, and uh, they would stay there. And I don't remember many people paying a lot of attention to it. The river itself used to carry a foot to a foot and a half of oil on its surface. And then they actually had people put yardsticks in to try to measure just how much oil was on the top of the surface of that river. In the 60s, Cleveland civic leaders talked a lot about the river. They knew what needed to be done, and they needed someone who could make it happen. He was a good-looking guy, and he had a personality to go with it. The, the Carl Stokes walked into a room, that room lit up. Well, he was like a rock star. You know, he was the first black mayor of a major city. It was 1967. Cleveland, at that time, was the eighth largest city in the nation. We had a population here uh, in the city in excess of 800,000. Stokes was a lawyer fascinated by politics. He figured out how to win elections by appealing to blacks and whites four decades before Barack Obama came on the scene. I mean, he's a hell of a speaker. You know, everything you might want to say about Obama would apply to Stokes, I guess. All of the news services and all the TV stations nationally had people stationed here because they were looking to Carl and say, what is he going to do? And then everyone was watching him to see how good a mayor he would be. Stokes was barely 40. He brought new faces to City Hall, including Ben Stefanski, a law school grad and banker who was just 28. It was like if people remember back when John F. Kennedy got uh, elected, there was a certain aura about government and that it could do things and people wanted to get involved and we wanted to face the problems. We are a new generation. We wanted to make things different than they were before. He had to prove some things. He had to prove he could produce as white mayors had produced in cities around the nation. There'd been riots in places like Detroit, Newark, and Cleveland before Stokes was mayor. It was thought that Carl Stokes was perhaps an insurance policy against riots occurring in a city like Cleveland. Nonetheless, we did have riots occur here in 1968. All eyes were on Cleveland to see if it would happen again during Stokes' watch. There's a lot more swimming on these beaches now. I can't get anybody to remember this, but I know, I know it's true. We have a, a park called Edgewater Park, and it's got a fairly large beach. And at one point in the 60s, they actually built a swimming pool in the lake. There really was a swimming pool in the lake. It was 1969. Carl Stokes hoped it would help keep the peace in the heat of that summer. Let me urge all of you to make maximum use of our swimming facility here. We looked around and the mayor's cabinet said to Carl, what, what should we do? And I came up with the idea that we needed to have activities for the kids and we needed them this summer. And where would that be? Well, on the beaches because we had the lake here, but the lake was dirty. 
we said, well, we thought if we could chlorinate part of the beaches, we would have uh, summer activities for the kids. So you do this every day in your yard. <laughs> Nobody had done it anywhere. It just sort of common sense. You looked at it. When you go to a swimming pool, what do you have in there to keep the water clean? Chlorine. So you have to contain the area where the beach is so the chlorine can work. <laughs> we ran a curtain on a cable from the break wall on the far right to the uh, break wall on the left there. I was in it, and I can't remember what it was made of precisely. It wasn't, it was some kind of a big heavy-duty garbage bag. Hello, how's the water? The swimming pool in the lake didn't last long, just two years, but it served as a useful reminder how unusable the rest of the lake had become. I know it sounds preposterous, but it wasn't for preposterous back then because if you wanted to swim in the lake, that was the best you were going to do. You were in the lake, but not part of the lake. <laughs> you know, the lake was a garbage bag's whip away. There'd be no rioting in Cleveland that summer, but there was that incident on the river that would change everything. We heard the word wherever we heard the word from, in the newspaper office, I guess it was, that something had caught fire on the river, an oil slick or something like that. That morning, about 9.30, the mayor called me and said, you know, we got to go over and look at the bridge that burned and the river that burned. And this didn't exactly bowl everybody over with surprise, you know, because, uh, well, okay, did they put it out? You know, <laughs> that was the question. This so was probably the fifth or sixth time that the river had caught fire, but it was just one of many fires that had taken place in many cities across North America and actually in Europe. The Mahongahela caught fire, the Chicago River, the Potomac, the Hudson. And of course, the river never burned. I kept telling people that, and they never paid any attention to me. I said, it's the oil burned on top of the river. People have this notion that the river itself suddenly caught on fire in its entirety, you know, and that isn't true. And we had that river fire in 69, but it wasn't a very good fire. We had a really great fire back in, like, uh, the 1950s. That was the Cuyahoga Fire of 1952. Time Magazine ran an old picture of it in 1969, and from that image, the myth of the burning river began. There's a red moon rising. And then Randy Newman wrote that song about the burning river, which I'm glad he did because it gave us a little panache. You know, we were taking crumbs anywhere we could get them back. <laughs> and if, we, if we're going to have the only river that burns, okay. The myth of the burning river had done its damage, but it's here where the story really begins. Until something happens, people have a tendency to let things lie dormant. Some type of action has to be taken when a river catches fire in your community. The big hang up in water pollution to this date has been money. After the incident on the Cuyahoga, two Cleveland brothers went to work in Washington. Congressman Lewis Stokes and Mayor Carl Stokes made their case for the cleanup of the river and Lake Erie. I had talked with the chairman of one of the subcommittees dealing with public works. He said to me, Lou, perhaps um, if you introduce legislation to make a pilot project of the Cuyahoga River, that being that if we can clean up the Cuyahoga River, we ought to be able to clean up then any nasty, dirty, filthy river in America. <laughs> the environmental movement gained traction and Congress passed the Clean Water Act. Today the Cuyahoga River is still what's considered a, a river of an area of concern. That being said, we have been able to clean it up almost completely. We can see fishermen back in the river fishing. It's a productive uh, piece of water. Now, every year, people get together on the waterfront for the Burning River Fest, hosted by the brewer of Burning River Pale Ale, made from the water of Lake Erie. That's been a brought on joke over the years. If I drink that uh, Burning River Pale Ale, can I smoke a cigarette or is it going to ignite and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We were the butt of jokes for a long time. Isn't it great that you can drink a beer with <laughs> Burning River on it? I mean, so we've crossed that threshold. And I think that's good that we start to embrace things that have happened in our, our past and not be ashamed. 